Good afternoon. It is Monday, November 8th. The Ag Market team is here to discuss and debate what the government is going to be throwing at us tomorrow with the big uh, November WASD number. But first things first, um, last week we announced that we had joined two new brokers that joined us, Robin Schmall and Kim Stevens. Well, right now we are happy to announce we've picked up an additional two brokers this week. Uh, Steve Wade and Tyler Wade are joining us from uh, Kentucky. So thank you, Steve and Tyler, for joining the Ag Market team. If any other customers are, le are listening, please, uh, we're glad to have uh, you join our team. If there's any questions that any of the Ag Market team members can uh, ask, please don't hesitate to give us a call. But with that, we're going to dive in because we've got a big WASD number coming out tomorrow. Um, I'm going to bring the whole team in here in a second. We're going to kind of show what the ag market team's looking at. But as you can see right now, group, the October guess for the corn carryout was 1.5. The average trade guess is dropping it down to about 1.84, 1.484. Being ending stocks, they see it going the wrong way. 320 in October, bumping up to 366. Not a whole lot of adjustment in the wheat. The trade's looking for a 580, adjusting to 582. The yield, that's the real question for everybody. Is the yield going to get bigger? The average trade guess suggests that the crop is going to get a little bit bigger from a 176.5 national yield to 176.9, pushing that corn crop to 15 billion, 50 million. Bean yield also looking for it to get a little bit bigger from 51.5 up to 51.9. I can tell people where I'm at here in Northern Illinois, I find it a little bit harder to argue this crop is going to get bigger, to be quite honest. We've definitely been struggling to get this crop out. A lot of disease pressure, a lot of beans are getting knocked out of the pods due to the rain we've had. But the market's definitely thinking we're going to get bigger with that. Um, I'm going to bring in our spreadsheet and I'm gonna bring Matt Bennett into the discussion. Matt, um, right here is our spreadsheet that we use to kind of debate and kind of come up with what our conclusions are, where we think this crop is going production-wise and inning stock-wise. Why don't you break it down for the group, kind of what the ag market team came up with? Yeah, and so, you know, essentially we felt like given last month's 176.5 trade guess, uh, you know, and it, Typically, whenever you get a couple uh, reports in a row where we increase yield, you're going to see more of an increase. But we got to remember they kind of lost steam. It didn't really raise a whole lot in October, first of all. Second of all, the weather hasn't exactly been conducive uh, to getting the crop out in a timely fashion. So, you know, we know that, like, for instance, where our uh, office is, uh, offices are, you know, in Iowa, they're talking pretty darn good yields, especially versus expectations. But then when you get in Jim's part of the world, my part of the world, Eastern Corn Belt, you know, there's a lot of folks that uh, maybe haven't seen uh, near as good of uh, versus expectations type yields, if you will. So we got, I guess we just felt like for right now, if they make an adjustment, it's not going to be a big one. And in the grand scheme of things, I think we feel like if they make an adjustment, that there's enough demand that we can adjust that it, it could likely uh, keep the carry out either where it's at or below. And so the only other adjustment we made on our entire spreadsheet was ethanol production. It went from the USDA's 5.2 in October, 5.2 billion bushels up to 5.3 billion bushels. So our ending stocks essentially came down around 100 million bushels versus USDA in October. Uh, we feel like uh, essentially, if they raise the yield, uh, again, th there's a pretty decent chance that we'll see enough demand. Now, we don't know how they're going to stair step into this demand. Uh, there's no question that uh, they've been somewhat laggard in the past. Uh, whenever you see things happen uh, with demand, but uh, given ethanol and grind and how much in excess it's running on a weekly basis right now versus what we need to meet to meet the USDA goal, uh, we felt like that was a, an adjustment that needs to be made here in November. So it'd be very interesting to see kind of how they approach not only yield, uh, but demand uh, as far as tomorrow's report's concerned. All right. Uh, real question. Real question quick question for anybody any of the other group do um exports they've definitely been lagging a little bit here recently are we bullish in a long-term group we think that the demand's going to pick up as we get into the season mind you we're only eight weeks technically into the marketing season or what does everyone think i know my opinion is i, I do think the demand's probably going to improve the government's probably understating it but anybody else got a real quick thoughts on the demand i know a lot of my customers have asked our opinion so anybody else have an opinion about the export demand uh, Jim, this is Bill. We need to 
we need to be shipping about 53 million bushels a week in corn. And we've been doing about, well, we're up to about 30 now. So we the last couple of weeks has really picked up. But uh, when we were talking to our friends at JSA and some of those have been involved in the international uh, export market for a long time, they believe that in the next few weeks, we will see a significant increase in corn as we move into that corn shipping period. We're, we're running real good on the beans on the shipping side. So that'll slow down and pick up with the beans. Okay, any other comments on demand on the corn side of the equation? Otherwise we'll move on to beans and have Matt go over the beans supply demand table. All right, Matt, you're back up. There's a bean table. What do you got for us? You know, so essentially on beans, I, I guess we felt like we would see an uptick in uh, what production might look like. Now, I, I would say that, you know, for me personally, and I think several of the guys and gals on the team would agree with this, we felt like maybe we could see a record type yield. I think the weather spooked us just a little bit there in late October, obviously a lot of wet weather. And typically, whenever you have to let the beans sit out in the field for too long, we all know that you can have some shatter loss and certainly have issues with harvest uh, losing you some bushels. And so I guess we were a little more conservative in our approach. Uh, we upticked our yield to 51.75, you know, and then we didn't really make a whole lot of additional adjustments. You know, we did raise crush uh, marginally uh, versus USDA because uh, quite frankly, crush margins have been awfully good. Uh, we've seen crush come in a little bit better than expectations for a lot of folks. And so, uh, you know, whenever we look at uh, where we're going to come in for this report, we kind of feel like uh, we'll be well in excess of 300 million bushels, but at the same time, we don't think it's going to get wildly carried away. You know, you've seen some estimates of, you know, up to 500 million, four to 500 million, and I don't think the ag market team is going to quite going to get to that point just yet. We definitely have some concerns on uh, exports. We've had pretty good pace here lately, and inspections, loadings, of, they've really been good here over the last three or four weeks, but uh, we certainly are, are concerned given the fact that the Brazilians got that crop in the ground so early uh, and they're essentially going to be entering the world export market much, much earlier than what they were a year ago. And so uh, from our vantage point, there are some concerns there with exports and we certainly didn't want to uh, make any huge adjustments just yet because we don't really feel like the USDA will. That's one thing I will say that you can ask anybody on our team whenever we're trying to um, you, know, you know, the four of us at least, Bill, Jim and Brian and I, and we definitely talk to the others about it, but we're trying to put together an estimate of what the report is going to say. And we try to stick to, you know, essentially what we feel is going to eventually happen, uh, which, which isn't always easy because sometimes USDA once again is very uh, calculated in their approach and uh, they don't always make adjustments as quickly as what we think they need to make. So it, it's quite the science trying to put together these estimates for USDA reports. All right. Hey, Matt, real quick, while we've got you with us, I'm going to put the wheat. Any big things in the wheat for the most part, or is it pretty much going to be a reprint of October and uh, wait to January before we get any really big wheat adjustments? What are we thinking? That's pretty much what we said. We didn't see anything major that would kind of jump out at us. Uh, we didn't really want to make any big adjustments. I think, you know, this report for November is typically going to be one in which, you know, the wheat market isn't exactly something that's going to be looked at terribly close. Now, I do think that there are some concerns amongst uh, people, uh, especially like in the soft red winter wheat country, you know, how many acres got planted, uh, what's the condition look like. Uh, uh, it, it certainly is going to be maybe something that we need to watch moving forward. And it'll be very interesting to see across all three wheats to see, uh, you know, what kind of a price reaction we might see uh, and try to encourage maybe some spring wheat acres in that part of the world. But uh, definitely don't look for any, any big adjustments as far as the report goes tomorrow. Okay, I think the run question, I think a lot of people are going to ask, and I'm going to just, anybody's, uh, not just Matt, if anybody else wants to chime in, I think the question is, what are the odds that this market is dialed in, this what looks like by the guesses is, is going to be a bearish report? The beans, essentially with the meltdown today, down 17 cents on the jam beans, we're essentially lower now than we were a few days after the October WASD. So what I guess the question is, what are the odds people think we're going to get another leg down or are we going to kind of put a double bottom in? Uh, anybody got a guess or anybody willing to kind of crawl onto that limb and uh, venture a guess? Hey, Jim, this is Kevin. Um, I mean, I think you're hitting on the potential theme that we could see tomorrow is 
you know, for all the numbers that the market is talking about, it is dialing in a bearish expectation, especially on beans. So if the USDA slow plays um, yield increases and slow plays this soybean demand story, just given the fact we do have some time yet to get the exports going and we're not quite sure exactly how this yield story, Western Corn Belt versus Eastern Corn Belt is going to play out. I mean, if, if they come in and leave the bean balance sheets unchanged, that could be a bullish shock to the market because, you know, we've done a lot of damage to the charts here and taken out some key support. So, you know, if we're lower going into that report tomorrow, the market's going to need to see some bearish news for us to hold the market down here. So as we've all said, I mean, who knows? you know, what they're going to throw at us. You can definitely make a case to raise carryouts for both corn and beans, but um, if they leave them relatively unchanged or if they raise corn demand, um, then you've got a pretty good corn and wheat story. We could see a pretty bullish response coming out of this report. So I think the key is just expect volatility and, and stay in close communication with all of us here to try to take advantage of what could be a trading opportunity, either going right into it or coming right out of it. Hey, Jim, this I, is Bill. I, mean, I, I just mm -hmm. want to point out that we as a full group of, of people working in this industry believe that the big risk is going to be more acres for next year. And I know Matt's done a lot of work on looking at those potential, I mean, carryovers. I mean, the one you got on the screen, if you just scroll up a little bit, is like potentially, you know, a 700 carryover. And, and I think, you know, we're 50% sold, which is real aggressive in the industry. So if we get that bullish response, uh, does anybody have any strategy ideas that we should be ready for? You know, I think the key uh, is just simply having, uh, you know, we've, we've discussed several of the options, whether it's a, a, you know, an HTA, whether it's buying a put option, whatever it might be. Uh, I think the key is to understanding how, just how that mixes into what you've already done. So if a person hasn't done anything yet, then I think an HTA makes a decent sense, especially when you're still hovering in this $12 level. If you can get above $12 and feel good about that sale, I don't have any problem with that. I think as you get more aggressive, you got to keep yourself open to the upside. And that's where some of our strategies come in, uh, maybe a little bit handier as far as buying a put option and selling a call. So, you know, originally we were buying a $12 put, selling a $10 put and selling a $14 call. And of course, that's going to be significantly more expensive today, which means that uh, trade has gained value. But essentially, that sort of a mindset makes sense because it gives you the upside to, uh, potential to participate in if uh, you get additional upside. So uh, I do like the flexibility of those. And again, I, you know, I, I just don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. Does that answer your question, Bill? Or you got anything specific you're thinking? I mean, I can tell you I've had some customers who have moved grain recently here on these beans. Like I said, we've been bearish beans. I've been bearish beans thinking this crop's bigger in the acreage argument. And one of the trades I had some people looking at, they're not too worried about if market rallies 50 cents. What they're worried about is that Brazil really starts to stumble. La Nino had everyone talking early in the year. It really hasn't come on full force. It looks like it could come on full force. Who knows what that means six months from now? One of the trades, Bill, I had some customers looking at, no margin risk, selling some of the beans right out of the field as they can't, they've run out of storage, buy the $13 call, selling a $15 call on the July spread for 30 cents. At the $2 upside for 30 cents, they're not going to make a lot of money right away, but if the market would explode for some reason, Brazil stumbles, China gets really aggressive, the bean oil market explodes on the biodiesel front or the inflationary front. For 30 cents, it keeps you into the game in case this market would really explode. I've had several customers do that or look at that as a way to maintain some ownership because they haven't instigated some of the trades we'd previously recommended, but that's what they're looking at, at least going into the, into tomorrow's numbers. Yeah, I, Are there any I had other a ideas anybody's looking at? I had a conversation with a customer today. The, 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 ten, the $12, $10, $14, we put that on for like six cents. It was 10 or less. And it's trading 36 today. So that one's kind of hard to put on. Uh, but anyway, this this customer, uh, he was he was looking at a uh, uh, I believe it was an 1180 um, 
and then 1380, something like that. But it was reasonable. I mean, the broker that you work with can can work with these strikes until they come up with a number that's pretty reasonable. Here, uh, here was another one they were looking at was a $12 1060. So you're hedged, but not hedged for two bucks. You're only hedged for a dollar forty down, selling a thirteen dollar instead of a fourteen dollar. And you know, are you really sure you'd be happy with thirteen bucks? Yes, absolutely. Okay, well that one's like eleven cents. But again, you know, when you're talking to your broker as a client, you, your broker can can we've got all these formulas that we can work with, and we can come up with something that eliminates a lot of risk for you, and and establishes a. a price you're happy with on a ceiling and does it at a cost that you're comfortable with. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Are there any other points anybody wants to bring out? I know Kevin from an email you sent me earlier, you want to talk a little bit about the late season. You're seeing some late session or late, excuse me, late season farmer selling, pressuring the market. Um, what are you seeing basis wise? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better out there? And in Iowa, or what are you what are you hearing, at least on the cash front? Yeah, I, I think just from a big picture, I mean, we're seeing, you know, uh, pressure on these futures that I think is related to, you know, guys' bins at home are full, so they're they're selling maybe a little bit better than expected yield. Um, you're, you've got some funds taking a little bit of profit going into this report, even though we saw a cot report as of, you know, last Tuesday with a very large corn position. But from a big picture, I just think we've seen um, people just looking to, to square up some positions going into this report. But if you flip over to the cash markets, you know, we are, we are seeing corn basis be very strong, historically high, really across the entire corn belt. And the bean crop is pretty well put away in most markets other than say the East. And that market is firming as well. So if you just look at the spreads in, in cash basis values, they're not bearish. So we've been talking about all the potential here of, these carryouts really growing, which is why I think we've come well off of our highs. But if you just look at spreads and basis values, this is still a tight market. So to your earlier point, we need South America to have a good crop and we need to figure out our supply chain issues to ensure we're able to get 180 million acres of corn and beans next year. And we've got a lot of things to figure out from supply chain, fertilizer, et cetera, before the market's gonna get overly comfortable. So I do think if we sell off going to this report, we're we're gonna find a floor here because there's still a lot of uncertainty in this market and, and basis and spreads are telling us the same. I would agree. I mean, this report, I think in the really big picture is gonna be more of a minor league report. I think the big report guys is probably gonna be this January report. I don't know anybody else's real quick opinions, but I still question the size of last year's carry out when the government put it at, when you look at the lack of, like Kevin was saying, the strong basis you're seeing for a crop that's supposed to be a you know pretty dang big crop, you know, a 15 billion bushel supply and the basis is heating up, it leads me to believe that we did not have a 1.3 plus billion carry out on last year's crop. And I think that's gonna continue to tighten, but we will not see that number folks tomorrow. That number probably won't show up till January at the earliest and possibly March. But I think in general, it, I guess what, so what the question is guys, if you've got grain and you don't need to sell it, are you telling people to hold it? Or what are you telling people to do, Kevin? Well, and Jim, I would just add, if you just look at, at future spreads of, you know, Dece July at 17 cents with Iowa basis values, you know, trading the end of harvest at overs. I mean, that that is a very strong market. So, I mean, historically you would expect to see closer to a 30 cent Dece July spread, um, you know, and, and still paying, you know, harvest values of call it 15 to 20 under Iowa. So when you look at at where cash markets and spreads are at, I mean, I think that just tells you that the end user is going to remain hungry. So, you know, these cash prices still are excellent revenue if you're behind on your marketing. But if you've followed our recommendations and you've you've been fairly active on your marketing, I mean, I think the market's telling us we've we've probably got an opportunity to to see some pretty good cash values going through Thanksgiving and trying to get coverage through the first part of January, which is really difficult for end users. So um, I think it really depends on where you're at on your marketing plan. But if, if you're behind, good level to make some sales. But if you're following our recommendations, I think you can be patient here. We've, we've had a pretty good sell-off from just last week's highs. Just my opinion. All I right. Mean, Thanks. It really depends where you're at. Okay. 
I appreciate that, Kevin. Any other comments from the group? Anything you got, Matt, before we wrap it up? No, I, I totally agree with what Kevin said. I mean, the thing is that you got to remember about these reports is that, uh, you know, regardless of what numbers come out, you don't know what kind of reaction we're going to see. And so when everyone is leaning overly bearish into a report, uh, I wouldn't get uh, uh, too worked up about, you know, selling everything uh, necessarily. Uh, but if you did, uh, remember, you're still looking at $12-ish beans. And so, uh, you know, you've got uh, really good price levels compared to the last several years. But again, I don't want to get too uh, worked up uh, uh, about you know, just completely bailing out, just simply due to the fact that we've been bearish coming into the report, because uh, many times you get a bearish, uh, bearish report after trading lower for the last several days and end up uh, the day higher uh, on report day. So just be cautious as to how you look at that. Okay. With that, I think we'll wrap it up. I think a good way to summarize it, Matt. I do want to make note the risk of loss of trading futures and or options is substantial and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. We will be back tomorrow uh, to kind of give a wrap up of what the numbers gave us. So uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, please call any of the Ag Market team members at 844-424-6758. And uh, like I said, any questions, give us a call. Uh, numbers are out at 11 o'clock Central Time tomorrow. Hey, Jim. Have a good luck trading the number. Yep. Hey, Ross, go ahead. Hey, uh, sorry for hopping in so late. Um, I just want to hit on cattle really quick. So figure uh, cash cattle traded last week. We saw the highest prices since the spring of 2019. So let's uh, just hit on them really quick here. Um, we did see um, a nice rally, obviously, in, in the cash market. Um, we had uh, all of the majors were pretty active last week. I mean, that is the first time we've seen uh, good participation from all the major uh, packers uh, for quite some time. Um, and it shows that the currentness that the cattle industry we've, we've gotten to, you know, we've had several um, cattle on feed reports, you know, with uh, friendly numbers. Um, we've had four straight reports with on feed being below a hundred. Um, and, and I just think the, the numbers were finally getting to where the, you know, the, the leverage is, you know, we are seeing a shift to the cattle feeders, um, which is good. It's been a long time coming. So hopefully, hopefully we can really, uh, you know, see cash continue to climb. We did see, uh, you know, call cash probably three to four higher last week. Um, I, there, there was some, uh, some, uh, dollar 30 cash that did trade here, uh, today in Northwest Iowa. So that's already higher money than what we saw last week, um, in our area. Um, I would say, you know, it's about too, too higher actually um, to start the week. So I think we will see cash probably continue to, to trend higher. Um, you know, demand remains extremely strong, um, domestic and global demand. So I think uh, we're, we're finally getting, you know, to a really good state in the cattle industry. And I, uh, I think this is, we're going to see this for a while to come yet. Um, you know, as most of our listeners, I mean, they've, they've heard us. I mean, we've been pretty friendly cattle um, just, just with what the numbers are looking like and, um, we should stay very current here. I mean, it's taken a long time to get current as anyone that's been feeding cattle knows. Um, but we're, we're finally getting to a, a pretty current state and I think we'll, we'll continue to stay that way. So I think we, uh, still got better days, you know, ahead in the cattle feeding industry. All right. Any other comments from the group before we wrap it up? All right, we'll wrap it up. Thanks for those final comments on the cattle. Ross, and uh, we will be back tomorrow with the report wrap-up. Thanks, guys.